Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Person You Want to Be. I am your host, Eric Teplitz. Today, it is my great pleasure and privilege to have with me on the podcast, Robert Greenberg. Robert Greenberg is a composer, pianist, speaker, author, educator, historian, advocate, and devotee of music. He received a BA in music, magna cum laude, from Princeton University in 1976, and a PhD in music composition from the University of California, Berkeley in 1984. He has composed more than 50 works for a wide variety of instrumental and vocal ensembles. Performances of his works have taken place across the United States, in England, Ireland, Greece, Italy, and the Netherlands, where his child's play for string quartet was performed at the Concert Gebot in Amsterdam. Dr. Greenberg has performed, taught, and lectured extensively across North America and Europe. He has served on the faculties of UC Berkeley, Cal State University East Bay, the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Since 1993, Dr. Greenberg has recorded 30 courses on a variety of musical subjects, totaling some 670 45-minute lectures for the teaching company, also known as The Great Courses, now under the banner of Wondrium. However they choose to brand themselves, they have long been known as the preeminent producer of college-level courses on media in the United States. Greenberg's 10-lecture course, The Life and Times of Beethoven, The First Angry Man, was released in October 2019 and was among the first offerings in Amazon's Audible Originals series. Greenberg has spent the pandemic blogging, vlogging, reviewing, performing, Zooming, ranting, and bloviating five days a week for his Patreon subscribers. He also serves as music historian in residence with San Francisco Performances, where he has lectured and performed since 1994. Of his many honors and accolades over the years, his favorite up until today, maybe I'll come up with a new one, a better one, his favorite came from the Bangor Daily News, which referred to him as the Elvis of music history and appreciation. Dr. Bob Greenberg, welcome to the person you want to be. Thank you so much, Eric. May I tell you a quick story since you were so <laughs> kind as to set me up, inadvertently so, uh, by mentioning the Elvis story that came out in 2003. And I was feeling pretty good about myself because I hold the king in the highest possible esteem. And I went to dinner that night. Uh, I have four kids. Two of them had not yet been born. But my 17-year-old and 13-year-old at the time were at the dinner table. And I was feeling good about myself. And I told them, guys, today the Bangor Daily News called me the Elvis of music history and appreciation. And they both looked at me with that typical disgust that teenagers have for all parental units. And um, my son, without looking up, the 13-year-old, said to me, uh, Dad, is that the good Memphis Elvis or the fat Vegas Elvis? <laughs> and my daughter, the 17-year-old, without missing a beat, said, the fat one, the pathetic one, the one that died sitting on the toilet. <laughs> so my wife was very annoyed with all of this. But I was proud because say what you want, my kids knew their Elvis. Excellent. And you know, um, I I would have taken it equally as a compliment if it if people had interpreted that as uh, the Elvis Costello of music there you go. appreciation right. in his. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, Elvis Costello famously said once that writing about music is like dancing about architecture. And I think that that is you know, a valid statement. We can't really hope to understand an art form unless we experience it. And that writing about it is is a pathetic substitute to try to communicate what it what it is all about. And yet you have written and spoken 
um, to an incredible degree. I'm astounded by how prolific you are on all of your various platforms um, about music. And But what you have done is you have, speaking from personal experience, who has long been a fan of your courses, you, you have essentially um, really helped facilitate the the this music's presence and and people's appreciation for it just by virtue of your sheer enthusiasm and your passion for the subject and your ability to convey it in such a way as to make people just can't, they can't wait to actually hear the music that you're that you're describing and and talking about so i think you've you've done music as a capital m music an incredible service over the years thank you um Igor Stravinsky, the great Russian-born American composer, uh, gave the Norton Lectures at Harvard University back in the 30s. And he began the whole series with what was basically a, a prophylactic statement, like the one that you just mentioned. Uh, his version of it was that verbal dialectic is incapable to describe musical dialectic in its entirety, which translates as it's really hard to talk about music. But it is possible to describe certain events. You know, we are such language-based creatures. Mm. And without language, without words, uh, we perhaps can't perceive certain things. I mean, the whole George Orwell idea of newspeak, of a language that consists of only, you know, a, a hundred words total, that if you could limit language, you could also limit thought process, mm. has something to be said for it. We laugh at silly languages like wine speak. You know, this 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 wine has the uh, uh, the body of uh, of the Gina Lola Brigida and the the uh, the sense of old tobacco. We laugh at that, but without words to describe something, without a vocabulary, can we consciously be aware of something? And I would claim that without certain words, I'm not just talking about terminology. But without the right words, we might not be able to consciously frame something. And that's why finding the right words to describe certain kinds of musical events is the key, is absolutely the key. Because what I want people to hear, my students, my clients, whomever, I want them to hear what I'm hearing. And I've spent a lifetime trying to understand what composers are trying to say. And if I can help them hear what I hear, and therefore hear what I think the composers meant to say, then suddenly we're not speaking some Esperanto, some foreign language. We're not listening to Macbeth in Swahili or, or in a language we don't know. We're listening to Macbeth in a language we do know, and suddenly its meaning explodes. And that really is what it's all about, isn't it? Trying to maximize our experience. It's just like we all have heard major chords, minor chords. We've heard music and songs in major keys and minor keys, but just being able to identify them as such is a way to be on the same page with people and even musicians communicating with each other, you know, use certain language to, as a shortcut, as a shorthand so that they can communicate ideas with each other and more effectively collaborate. So I, I really agree with what you're saying about the importance of having a vocabulary and language to describe things, even though it is not the same as the things being described. Words are always metaphors for the things they represent, right? Right. But we need something to hold on to. You know, you take a piece of music that everyone thinks they know, like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, da 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 dum. Um, we can listen to it purely as music, or we could listen to it as a work by Beethoven that has certain meanings. Uh, that represent what he was going through at the time, that represent his time and his place. And that's the other thing, as you know, that I try to do is, is music is, and all music is a function of its time and place. Uh, the social aspects of a time, the religious aspects, the aesthetic aspects, of uh, hi history and music are indivisible from each other. And so the more we know about the environment in which a piece was created, the more we know about the person who created it, the more likely it is we'll actually hear the music as a, as a dialogue, as a worldview, uh, and not just as a sequence of events, of rhythms and sounds. And language can't get us all the way there, 
but it can get us to the point where we can open the door and start accessing the actual musical content of a piece. It took me a long time to develop an ability to do this. I taught adult courses for probably 20 years and having to talk to people who are not musicians, mm. uh, but who are interested and worldly in their experience gave me the wherewithal to realize that you don't need to be a musician to understand Beethoven or Mahler or anything, any music from anywhere. You simply need an open mind and and uh, and enough vocabulary to start framing correspondence be cer between certain descriptors and certain sounds. So speaking of time and place and context, I would like you to indulge me, if you don't mind, and take us back to your childhood. And specifically, if you could describe the, the environment, the time and place in which you were born and grew up and use that as a context to answer this question. What I'm interested in knowing is what was your earliest sense as a child of who or what it was you wanted to be, you wanted to do, you, why, you know, what you were here for, your earliest sense of that, even if it was just a, a crazy, fantastical childhood fantasy or what have you. Um, every now and then we read about some major musician, be they a performer or a composer, that was the first musician in their family. That was not me. I was always surrounded, luckily or unluckily, mm -hmm. depending on how we want to talk about my career. I was always surrounded by music and art. I was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1954. My parents rather quickly moved to the New Jersey suburbs. Uh, my dad worked in Philadelphia, so I actually grew up in southern New Jersey. What part of it, Philly did he work in? I'm from Philly, so. Oh, really? He well, right downtown on, on, on Broad Street. Yeah, central central Philly. And uh, and the town I grew up with in was about 25 minutes away, so not far. And even though my parents were hardcore New Yorkers, whether they liked it or not, and the answer is not, uh, Philadelphia was the urban area closest at hand. <laughs> Uh, but back to your question, uh, and I'll answer it by telling you about my grandmothers, because they were the ones that shaped me even from the youngest age. My father's mother graduated from the Juilliard School in 1916, eight years before it was even called Juilliard. It was called the New York Institute of Musical Art back then. And she graduated with a degree in piano, and she was a hellacious piano player. Hmm. And she tortured generations of students in Queens, New York. Oh, she was tough. She tortured my father, she tortured me, who knows how many others with these old style teaching techniques. But they were effective. And from the youngest age, I heard my father play piano. I heard my grandmother play piano. So there were always pianos around me and it always made sense to bang on them and to imitate them and then to start playing when I got to the age where lessons were appropriate. My other grandmother, my mother's mother was a well-known Broadway actress and, and, and to a lesser degree movie and television actress who surrounded herself with musicians. And so whenever we visited uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents who lived on the Upper West Side at 82nd and Riverside Drive, it was all a matter of going to the New York Phil or going to the opera or going to the theater or watching her in a play. So the performing arts were, it, it was just intrinsic. I remember growing up and listening to records that my dad would put on of Broadway musicals uh, of jazz, jazz piano in particular, Errol Garner and Dave Brubeck. And I'm talking about real young. I'm talking about my earliest memories, four years old, five mm -hmm. years old. So it was just a constant presence and a delightful presence. Mm -hmm. You know, unlike, unlike certain other things in life, there was no effort involved in learning to play the piano. And there was no sense of responsibility. It was fun. It was all fun. And so foolishly, I assumed that a career in music would be fun too. And uh, <laughs> I, I won't start getting down on choices. Let's just say that as soon as you have to make money doing something, mm. uh, it becomes increasingly a chore and less, a, uh, and less a fun. But music was always there and, uh, and I fell into it effortlessly. So one thing that, fascinates me endlessly is this dichotomy of, you know, this argument of nature versus nurture and which is the, which has the greater influence on us. And 
I know that you are a huge proponent of understanding context and emphasizing the importance of context. And I personally agree with you, couldn't agree with you more. Yet you did have two brothers, right? Yeah. And I'm guessing that neither of them became musicians. Is that correct? That is correct. So they, Although, they grew up in a similar environment. Now, of course, there's birth order and other factors involved, but you know, there is this um tension between, you know, how much of this is is you know your nature versus your nurture that your your uh attraction to music um you you had it you were surrounded by it but i'm guessing your brothers were too no uh one of those brothers is a stepbrother so we can't we can't make a genetic connection okay. that. but my younger brother is my full brother uh, and he certainly had a talent i remember he started mm. taking violin lessons because there was no way he was going to compete with me at piano mm. He was already, uh, he was a couple of years younger than I am. And he got frustrated and he, I don't think he wanted to have to live up to my example because I was very successful at a young age. And that's the curse of younger siblings, isn't mm -hmm. it? They're following in footsteps. If you have an older sibling that's successful at something, you're likely to want to find your own route to success. And he did. He's a high-end radiologist in Boston mm -hmm. who's about to retire and live the good life uh, and I, you know, I'll retire when you box me up and get away. <laughs> so he, uh, the talent was there, I think. The question is, how do you how do you use it? You know, here's one I'll I'll I'll, st I'll stick there for you, Eric. It, it it's um, it's a question that I used to be asked a lot, not so much anymore. But it's an aggressive question uh, that comes from people who say, well, where are the Beethovens today? Where are the Mozarts today? I mean, you're a composer. I mean, why aren't you guys as good as blah, 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 blah. And there are two responses. Actually, there are three responses to that question. One of them is just go away. But that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the one I use. Um, the first response is for all you know, the Mozarts and Beethovens are everywhere. Mm. But because of the language of contemporary music, it's music that's much less difficult, much more difficult, rather, to comprehend, and only time will tell us. In their own time, Mozart was not the Mozart we know. Not even Beethoven was the Beethoven we know. We only know their greatness now because we see their life's work as an entire entity. And we've had a long time to understand how good they were to a much greater degree than their contemporaries ever could. Hmm. But the other response I have is it's cultural. Where are the Beethovens and Mozarts today? I'm pointing that way because that's south from where I'm standing. And about 30 miles that way is Silicon Valley. Hmm. And it's filled with some of the smartest people in the world. Well, you want to know where the Beethovens and the Mozarts are today? They're down in Silicon Valley. Because our culture rewards and has opportunity for the highest talent level in that world, in the technical world. Right. And there's the culture. In, in the culture of, of 18th and early 19th century Vienna, the best and the brightest tended to go into the arts. Hmm. Uh, in our culture today, here in the United States, especially on the West Coast, well, many of the best and brightest go into high tech because that's where the opportunities are. So it depends, again, on, on the cultural environment. I mean, what again, what if Beethoven, who was born on December 1770. 16, 1770, good for you. What if Beethoven had been born in Philadelphia? In Northeast Philadelphia. Okay. In I, 1970 instead of 1770. No, well, this is, these are the, I love these right, questions. Right. Go for it. Let well, me hear it. <laughs> let's say, let's say it was 1770 and his father was a mediocrity. Let's say his father was still a mediocrity, but his father would not have been a musician. His grandfather would not have been a musician. Musicians were not necessary in the new world, and they certainly weren't part of the new economy. They undoubtedly would have been part of the merchant class. Beethoven might have been brilliant at what he did, but he wouldn't have become a musician. He would have become a banker. He would have become a business person. He might have been an entrepreneur. Hmm. Uh, but the opportunities to be trained as a musician, the opportunities to have a career as a musician simply would not have existed at that place. So the Beethoven we know wouldn't have existed. 
you have to really have that perfect storm of circumstances. Yeah. And, and that's true across the board. I mean, could Einstein have been Einstein if he'd been born at another time and another place? What if someone had already done the work he ended up doing in 1906 in that miraculous year of his? We really cannot take the, um, the environment away from the talent. You're reminding me I'm a uh, over-the-top Beatles nut. And... Oh, me too. Me too. Good for you. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. And there was a documentary you might recall that is very hard to find these days. It came out in the early 80s called The Complete, that is C-O-M-P-L-E-A-T, The Complete Beatles. And it was only, it was it was maybe two hours mm. long, but it was fantastic. And uh, there was a, towards the end of the, of the film, they interviewed George Martin, the Beatles producer, and- they're, they ask him, how do you account for this phenomenon? How do you account for these four guys from Liverpool, these working class guys changing the world, you know, with their music? You know, how do you explain it? And his answer, I'll never forget his answer, even though it's been decades since I've seen the documentary. He basically said, you know, their timing was right. It was chosen mm. for them. They didn't choose it, but their timing was right. And he's he was he was referring to that confluence of of factors that you that you are just you know that you were elucidating you know the where and when they happened to be born and in the context you know uh, coming out of World War II, growing up in Liverpool, discovering American rock and roll, and then of course all of these fortuitous things had to had to fall into place. Meeting certain people at certain times, you know the them you know being on the Ed Sullivan show on that fateful day in February of 1964, you know, these things and, and, and what t television meant at that time, like you take the context away and, you know, it's who knows, right. who knows, but we would have most likely, you know, never, we would have been deprived of the Beatles and who knows what other things we have been deprived of as a function of people being born at the wrong place or at the wrong time. I'm another thing. I'm just curious to get your, your opinion on. Let's suppose Beethoven just for the sake of argument was born you know, current day, let's say he was a millennial now and, you know, he was growing up, let's say he even had, you know, a fair access to, to music education and, and uh, was, was encouraged in some way to, to pursue this talent, this gift that he had, what, what would he have done with the internet and just the endless distractions that, that are so a part of our lives now you know, would the most prolific of composers been anywhere near as prolific as they were in this era of endless distraction? Would they have been more prolific because they would have had access to technology that would have allowed them to record their ideas more efficiently? Or, you know, what do you, what do you think of these? I'm just going to let you riff on that. <laughs> well, again, it, it's a who knows situation. If he was still writing what we'd consider concert music, uh, what I prefer not to call classical music, but that's the, the general yeah. phrase, then he would be on the musical fringes of our world. I mean, that's my world too. So I'm happy to admit that I, I exist on a fringe. He would not have been a mainstream uh, composer. Uh, orchestras are not interested in playing that music anymore. Opera houses are not interested in new music. I mean, everyone could say, well, they did that and they did that. But the bottom line is there's a lot of great composers who've never had an orchestral performance by a professional group because professional groups simply know that it's box office poison. Right. And, and they have they, to, they have to like slip it in, in between, you know, uh, widely loved. Correct. Work, classic works. The, it, it has to be the last piece in the first half of the program. Hmm. And you have to have a very popular piece on the second half of the program. That's the only thing that keeps people in their seats because if you put it on the second half of the program, they will vamoose during intermission, and that will be the end of that. So if Beethoven was doing concert music, like my world, he would be, no matter how good he was, uh, a footnote in the, in the grand hmm. musical thing. If, however, he was drawn to jazz, or even more importantly, rock and roll, or some aspect of pop music, then who knows how famous he might have been. I mean, this is this is a great story. I'm trying to remember the name of the story. I've got it in a book. It's a, it's a short story by the science fiction writer Robert Silverberg. And it takes as its premise that sometime in the future, we can go back and grab someone from the past and bring them into the present. The question is, who should we 
do this with first as an experiment. It can't be someone who's too famous, but it has to be someone worth bringing to the future. And it has to be someone who's so close to death that we're not depriving that time of a particular person. And so the, the person they decide to bring forward is a Italian composer named Pergolese, uh, Giovanni Battista Pergolese, who was this brilliant young Italian composer who died at the age of 26 hmm. uh, in about 1735, 1736. So they bring him forward and, you know, they isolate him and slowly start educating him and teaching him and so forth and cure him yeah. of the disease that killed him. And to make a long story short, instead of him being a composer again, he gets into rock and roll, runs off one day, becomes a famous rock and roller, and then kills himself with drugs the same way he killed himself back in 1736, meaning that you can change someone's time and place. You can't change the personality. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah, there <laughs> and, and there you are. So how did we get onto that? You would ask me to riff. Oh, just speculating about people born out of time, you know, right. in different contexts Where and people that, people that we revere as, you know, uh, the preeminent in their fields you know, what, what would it look like if they were alive in today's world or, or, you know, born into a different situation? And, you know, Beethoven, as you've, as I've, I've learned a tremendous amount from listening to your lectures, you know, he was motivated in large part by his, um, his, the abuse that he experienced as a kid and, and that shaped his personality and no, no doubt in my mind contributed to his many ailments physically and psychologically you know, today and with today's lens, mm -hmm. I bet that a lot of his physical ailments would be attributed to the trauma that he experienced because it would, you know, the abuse and trauma that he experienced as a, as a young kid. Um, but that also, you know, gave him fuel, right? And and he right. used that that fury as fuel right. to prove himself and to express himself. And so would he have been capable? Oh, so, okay. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the long held myth of the tortured artist, okay. Um, you know, what do you think, what role do you feel suffering plays in the creation of great art? You know, we're, we're all a reflection of our own experience. And it's not just a matter of art, it's how we raise our kids, it's, it's how we do our jobs, it's how we go about perceiving the world around us, it's how we vote, it's the books we read, it's all a reflection of, of our, whatever our unique genetic traits are as complemented by our environment and our upbringing. Uh, this issue of illness is, is, is big in, in the arts. It's something that's been written about a lot. For example, the 19th century and the 18th century were, were great centuries, if I can put it that way, of, uh, of syphilis. And there are docs out there who've written extensively on the neuro damage mm -hmm. that syphilis has. And that some composers, uh, most notably Robert Schumann, uh, the Czech composer Biedrich Smetna, were talking about people who lived with syphilis for a long time and ended up dying from it, went through a period of, of hearing voices and writing down the things they heard. And the speculation is they could never have written much of their late music had they not been going through this neurological process that in some ways freed their minds. With Beethoven, of course, it's the deafness or the hearing disability that left, led to his deafness. Could, would Beethoven have been the Beethoven we know had he not isolated himself and discovered within himself a, a rage but an inspiration that he never, never would have found otherwise? No, Beethoven's pain was our gain. And that's a terrible thing for Beethoven. But in reality, his illness, which, by the way, could have been cured without patient surgery today, um, a calcification of his stirrup bones because of a, uh, a dose of typhoid fever in 1796, you know, right, he would have been cured, and Beethoven would not have been Beethoven. Misery is just another deep human experience, and illness is perhaps the deepest form of misery. Hmm. And... All of these things affected composers. Uh, an, another case, Schubert, who, who did have syphilis. And in, in um, 1824, when the guy was just 26 years old, he's diagnosed with syphilis, which was a death sentence in those days, like having AIDS in 1985. And his music changed overnight. 
overnight, it went from being this extremely pleasant, Biedermeyer, amusing and sometimes deep music to a profoundly moving, uh, highly contrasted kind of music, which was obviously a reflection of where he was psychologically. So illness plays a huge role in creativity. And the fact that we can cure so many illnesses now that at another time would have been debilitating, if not fatal, uh, perhaps has impacted negatively on artistic output. Hmm. Having said that, who wants to go progressively <laughs> death in their young adulthood? That's too high a price to pay, as far as right. I'm concerned. You know, yeah, It reminds me of uh, Huxley's Brave New World, where they, they were creating this society where suffering was basically like not even allowed and mm. you know and they would they would come in and like and and spray the room with a drug called soma and everyone would suddenly their anxieties would disappear and they'd be fine and they'd you know but it basically like created a completely sterile and and you know, environment and sort of just robbed like it was basically uh, a recipe for building a world that was sucked of its humanity and and mm. certainly art suffered and and it's this fascinating thing who what compassionate person would not be for the elimination of suffering? Um, but the question then becomes, you know, what are the costs of that? And I, I think that that is an endlessly fascinating philosophical discussion. But I want to bring this back to you and your personal story, because that's what really interests me here in this conversation. And you as a child really having a penchant for piano playing, obviously, like the conditions were 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 right and ripe for your, um, you know, becoming proficient at the instrument and you you were surrounded by music you were encouraged to learn music by your grandmother uh and you took to it for whatever reason and you know you clearly had a, an ability in fact i i understand that you were playing beethoven sonatas at elementary school assemblies is that right yeah yeah but you know what in retrospect having taught at a conservatory in san francisco uh for 16 years you get to see real talent <laughs> you, get, you get to see these kids, these children. Mm. Um, I'm not talking about eight-year-olds. I mean, my students were undergraduates, but they're 98% of the way there. And none of them end up in a career, by the way. I mean, mm. maybe one out of every 500 ends up with a career. So it's heartbreaking to see them go into debt by 200K and, and to be living their passion with the realization as a faculty member that they probably were, are going to have to retrain as a coder when they get the hell out. Mm. It's very, it's one of the reasons why I was happy to leave that job. But anyway, back to the point. Yes, I was playing Beethoven sonatas in assemblies in, in, in elementary school, which is, as I have found out, not completely typical of, uh, of semi-talented kids. Right. But the adults around you think it's just amazing. And, you know, you're functioning off of, as a child, you're functioning you're inspired by their reaction. Mm. This is why so many, I wasn't a prodigy, but, but this is one reason why so many prodigies crash and burn. Because the high that you ride on by having all this positive, complimentary energy around you as a child simply disappears when you become an adolescent, because now you're a dime a dozen. Right. You go to a place like the San Francisco Conservatory, okay, maybe in your hometown in Iowa, you were a big darn deal. You go away to a place where there's lots of big darn deals. You're not a big darn deal at all. You're just one of them. And now you have to compete at a level so much higher mm -hmm. than you ever had to compete. And you don't have everyone around you telling you how great you are all the time. There's just no incentive to keep working five, six, seven hours a day, especially at an age when you want to be out there with your contemporaries and dating and, and, and just being a person and, having spent too much time practicing your instrument as a youngster, that also happens in adolescence. I want to be myself. I think this happens with kids who are forced into skating or forced into tennis or any sport um, by their parents who want to live vicariously through their children's accomplishments. Mm -hmm. That there comes a time when, no matter how prodigious you were as a child, you as a person want to have your own life. So anyway, back to your question. I did play Beethoven sonatas in assemblies. And all that positive feedback was very good for me. Um, 
And, uh, but I was able to make the transition because I never wanted to be a professional performer. And when I did get into performing, it was as a jazz musician. It wasn't mm. as a, uh, it wasn't as a, a concert player. What about composing? When did that, you know, become an interest? Very early. Um, again, growing up when I did in the late fifties and sixties, uh, I fell in love with rock and roll, just like everyone of my generation should have. <laughs> and if they didn't, there's something really <laughs> wrong with them. And so uh, at the, I don't know, by the age of eight or nine, I was writing my own rock and roll songs. And my grandmother would help me write them down, uh, notate them, mm -hmm. because I was doing everything by ear when it came to the writing. So I had to learn how to notate. And she taught me how to notate. And again, it was just a very natural process. It's nothing I had to work at very hard. Then I really got into jazz when I was 14. And that was, that was my epiphany. Jazz was my epiphany. Um, and I got good at that. And, and, and I did play professionally for a few years. And so everything I was writing was jazz oriented. And then I had to decide as an undergraduate music major, um, was I actually going to pursue this as a living uh, or was I going to uh, get a real job, as my parents put it? Hmm. I still remember it was it was so funny. It was my junior year, and uh, my sophomore year, I had to declare a major. And I remember having this conversation with them uh, that I was going to major in music, and they both looked at me stricken. And I remember my mother saying, "A musician? What are you talking about?" And my father saying. I think you need to revisit this. I want you to think about this. And I looked at them like they were nuts. I said, you gave me, why did you give me piano lessons? You created a monster. Years? Right, exactly. Excuse me. <laughs> where, uh, what did you expect? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Come on. So, uh, but having majored in music, you know, you have to decide uh, uh, what path you want to take. Now, you want to talk about time and place. If I was a senior in college today, I would never have gone into music, much as I loved it, because whatever opportunities were available in 1976 when I graduated, 99% uh, of them don't exist anymore, whether they're teaching positions or composing positions or whatever. Uh, the world has changed. Here's a serious question. If you were of college age today, would even going to college be, you know, I mean, given given the cost right. of education and given the uncertainty of what's going to happen when you when you get out, uh, right. and given the proliferation of free educational, you know, material at our disposal um, online, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but it's certainly worlds cheaper, <laughs> and there are a lot of areas where, you know, I mean, a college degree. Uh, it doesn't have the same cachet as it maybe once did. And really what counts is your skills, right? But what, I don't know, what, you know, what, what do you think you, what, what, what path might you have taken if, you know, if you were coming of age today and needing to make a decision about a, a major in college or even a career path now, what do you think? Um... You know what? <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> Beethoven's I fifth. Have, You'll plead I mean, Beethoven's well, fifth. I wish, I wish. Or Tchaikovsky's <laughs> fifth, right? Shostakovich's fifth. Mm -hmm. um, no, I have, I have, I'm clueless because my, my whole life growing up as it was, was predicated on this affection for music and the fact that I, I thought I could do it, uh, do it as a career. And in what sense specifically, like, did you imagine yourself, how did you imagine yourself paying the bills with music, doing what specifically back what then? Child, what, what did you think back then? What child ever thinks <laughs> such, such thoughts of paying the bills? I mean, my one grandmother was an actress and my other grandmother was a professional musician, a, a successful piano player. I mean, yeah, all, all things were possible. Hmm. And, um, but, you know, so, so this was my environment. No one ever, I, I don't think anyone who's 16 or 17 or even 18 or 19 thinks very practically, especially not when I was a kid. I mean, the whole art, the whole point of going to, everyone wanted to go to college because A, it's what you did after high school, but B, it's when you had a chance to grow up, mm. right? Outside of the house of your parents, you got to experience semi-adulthood, but you were still being underwritten. 
financially. I mean, what's more irresistible than that? Debt wasn't an issue. I paid off my student loans after 25 years, but they were 3% student loans. Besides which, the full ride at Princeton when I went there was about 4 k a year, tuition, room, and board. I mean, you look at $75,000, $80,000 a year now. It's unthinkable. It's, it's unthinkable. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but in all honesty, I haven't even a remote clue hmm. where my interests would have taken me because... I never felt the need to have any other interests mm -hmm. when I was growing no up. No plan B. No plan B. Right. So it was a pretty easy decision for you then because you were single, had sort of single-mindedly attracted to and, and interested and focused on I, music. It, it wasn't even a decision. Hmm. I, I just took the easiest path. What, you know, I just took the, what seemed to be the most natural path. So um, you, grad, you graduate from Princeton and um, then, then what happens? <laughs> you know, I did that post-college thing for a year. I, I traveled with what money I had and continued taking composition lessons. And then uh, I taught high school for a year. And then I realized in teaching high school, this really is for the birds. Um, <laughs> nothing personal, high school teachers. This was a private school for girls who had not been successful at other schools. And here I'm a 23-year-old guy. Mm -hmm with some girls who were high schoolers at the age of 20 because they had been put back. Huh. Uh, it was a scary place. As I look back, having grown up with brothers and not really knowing girls, man, it was an education by itself. So I decided it was time to go to grad school. And I always wanted to be in California. Hmm. And so when I got into UC Berkeley at graduate school, it was a natural and I've never lived far away. Again, that way is North and the Berkeley campus is about four miles in that direction. And um, once I got to California on September 9th of 1978, I, it took me about a day to say, I'm home. Here I am. Here I am. And, uh, and I've had a very good life because I stayed. I have to that's, say. That's so interesting. You know, I mean, I'm of a different generation. I'm a Gen Xer, but I had a similar experience of transplanting really? myself to the West Coast and really feeling at home. And it's so interesting because, you know, they say, as I quoted earlier, you, wherever you go, there you are. And a lot of people attempt to solve their problems by moving to another place. And um, that might work and it might not. But I think that if it's done, I think either if you're very lucky or if it's done with a certain amount of um, intentionality, like you're going to a certain place because it offers things that that you know bring you to life that, you know, appeal to you. Um, that call to you, then I think there is something to be said for that. Because as we've been saying, this whole conversation environment is so crucial to to what happens to us and and what we become. Right? Where, where do you live? I'm in Los Angeles, just uh, West LA. Got it. Well, West LA is fantastic. You know, when you're native Californian, as I think we both found out, when you're native Californian and you come, you have from no idea. You 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 can't possibly appreciate it the same way. <laughs> you can't appreciate it the same way. And if you're from Northern California, you just look down on Southern California. Right. It's the worst place in the world. But because I'm not a native Californian, I can love LA as much as I darn please, and I I do. I have great affection for Los Angeles. I have family in the in in the Valley and and mm -hmm. in LA proper, and in Orange County. And I always love going down there to visit. It's it's a fascinating, a truly unique place. And my wife is from Northern California. She's from the Bay Area and really? grew up in a family that poo-pooed LA for sure. Yeah. Um, and that was part of her motivation for for coming here. But she, you know, but um, you know, without that bias uh that you know that seems to be uh present in a lot of Northern Californians, native Northern Californians. Um, I, I equally love Northern California. Um, it's different, obviously. Um, but California in general holds a lot of appeal to me. And it, moving to California was easily within the top decisions of my entire life. Like, hand, like no question, bar none. When people are foolish enough to ask me for life advice, <laughs> and now that I've gotten to a certain age, God bless me, people ask me more than I'd like them to. Um, all I can say is live precisely where you want to live. Hmm. One of the problems with academia, and I was part of academia for a long time, is that when you get your whatever your final degree is, 
now you send your box tops out to everyone and you keep your fingers crossed that someone's going to hire you. And you have to be prepared to go anywhere. Right. Wherever if you the get is. hired at Eastern Iowa State University, that's where you are. And you think you're going to stay for three years and then move up. But it, it this might be it. This could be it. I wasn't willing to do that. I simply wasn't willing to do that. So the advice I give is, number one, live where you want to live. Because for me, that's been the key to success. The second piece of advice I give is whatever profession or whatever job you take, always adhere to the highest possible standards and never compromise what you do. And that's it. I don't give personal advice because my own personal life has been such a mess, as all our personal lives can be, that I'm in no position to give anyone advice about how to run your personal life. But in terms of where you live and how you act as a professional, I feel comfortable about that. Coming to California for me, the quality of the air, mm. the, the simple beauty of the Bay Area, and the fact that I found a bigger difference uh, in terms of attitude between the East Coast and California than I found between Europe and the East Coast. You know, for all mm. of our, for all of my experience in suburbia, it was still like living on a shtetl. Everyone was identified where I grew up by their ethnicity and their race. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of tension uh, between the Italians and, and the Polish and the Jews and the blacks. There were, there were no uh, Asians whatsoever. Um, prejudice was, was rife in a way that I've never encountered out here in California. Uh, this is as close to the meritocracy as I've ever been. Mm. You know, uh, here you are where you are, period. That's, you know, whatever you achieve, you, you do it on your own. And uh, I, I just felt, it felt right to me. And this is in no way to put down New York or, or New Jersey. No, no, no. And, and, it's, and it's a very personal thing, you know, to, right. to the affinity that you feel for a place. Um, is very, very personal. And it can obviously change through through right. the course of your life. Um, I didn't know how long I was going to live here when I moved here. I've been here 20 plus years and, you know, and, and who knows, uh, you know, what the future holds and what, you know, what may cause one to relocate at any given point in one's life. So I'm very, very careful to, to never say never. I've right. learned that lesson too many times. But that said, I do think that I agree with you that um, finding an environment that, um, that, 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 that you feel nurtures you and that you find stimulating and that you find, you know, helps you be the person you want to be uh, is, is an incredibly valuable thing. And some people stumble onto it. Some people never do just because it doesn't occur to them to live anywhere else. And some people, like you say, um, circumstances dictate it, like they have to go where the work is, or, or you know, uh, they have family roots that they can't, um, that they, they, they don't feel they can, you know, leave. Um, but I, I like that. I think that's a that's an unusual piece of advice, actually. I think um, to um, to be precise about where you want to live. Um, so you graduate from UC Berkeley with a PhD in music composition. Then you know I'm, you you can only avoid needing to pay bills for so long, as I've learned and many have learned. What what happened next, and what what decisions did you make personally, professionally from there? Um, yeah, I always call that period between finishing your final degree, whatever it is, and having your first real, draw, real job as the valley of death. <laughs> so you're asking me, how did I, how did I get through the wilderness? Um, I married three years before I finished grad school. I married when I was 27. And uh, she was a singer although she ended up going to law school and I put her through law school and uh, we both finished school at the same time in 84. Mm -hmm. uh, I gave a lot of piano lessons. I taught a lot of extension that is adult classes for the university of California extension. And that's how I got involved at the San Francisco conservatory teaching for their extension. You know, the thing about musicians and I guess anyone in the arts is you do First of all, the word no cannot be part of your vocabulary. Everything has to be yes, no matter how crazy your schedule is, because you never know when you're going to close a door by saying no. 
So I always said yes. And I did a tremendous amount of scut work. I did copying work, music copying work. I did dictation work where song writers would come into my house and sing their songs and I'd write them down for them and add the harmonies. I mean, whatever it took. And I was young and there were no kids yet. So it was actually kind of fun. Hmm. Uh, I ended up with some students that I'd never expected I'd have. I don't know if you know a drummer named Tony Williams, a very, very famous jazz mm -hmm. drummer. But Tony was my composition student for five years. Mm -hmm. um, you, you never knew who was going to walk in the door. And did you did you have a particular aspiration as you were doing all of these, you know, kind of, they were all related to music still, your, your odd right. jobs, but did you have a, a particular like ambition um, that that kind of, drove you or were you just kind of taking it as it came? I wanted to be a composer mm -hmm. and I wrote a lot of music and some of it's, I think, very good. And I was lucky enough to be part of a composer's organization called Composers Inc. We existed for 35 years. So I got to hear it performed in San Francisco. I got a lot mm -hmm. of great press and that's really what I wanted to do. And I, I thought of everything else as supplying my habit, as mm -hmm. giving me the money I needed. And the fact that I, I, I married someone who, be, who was, didn't just go to law school, but graduated number one in her law school class and then clerked for a federal judge, and there was a very highly sought after attorney. Um, monetarily, once she started working, uh, the pressures to make the big bucks were never there on me. Of course, <laughs> as soon as she started to make the big bucks, we divorced. So that was the end of that. But I found my own way financially. I got involved with a teaching company. I, I started making courses. Oh, I, I want to definitely ask you about that because right. to me, this is one of those, I would imagine, inflection points. I mean, like, you know, massive, like, you know, moments in one's life looking back that that really were pretty defining. Because I I would imagine that you're best known for those, those courses. Certainly, that's how I became aware of you. And, um, you know... The impact that we want to have is not necessarily the impact that we actually have, or the thing that we're most sort of appreciated for may or may not be the thing that we most want to be appreciated for. But you, you know, for whatever it's worth, good sir, <laughs> you happen to have an exceptional talent for teaching and for um, bloviating, to use your word, uh, pontificating about the thing you're most passionate about. And you do it in such a compelling and entertaining, I might add, way as to just draw the listener in. I want to just take a moment, I'm sure you'll indulge me, <laughs> uh, to talk a little bit about um, teaching and, and specifically history, I think, because you know the way I was brought up in public school in Northeast Philly, history was the driest subject imaginable it was completely devoid of any humanity whatsoever it was it meant nothing there was no there was no connection to it we we had to memorize dates and names and events and it was endless wars and there was nothing to understand there was nothing to to connect with the who were these aliens that that lived before us like they didn't watch tv how can i relate to them that was sort of you know um and it was it was just so you know, there was no connection to it. There was no interest in it. And, you know, the way that you, cause you know, you're, you're teaching music, but you're also teaching history in a lot of your courses oh, yeah. and you bring it to life and you, you help us understand and become fascinated with, because you give us points of connection with people from history. We can relate to them. We can understand their, their, their motivations and their com competing drives and their personalities. And this is what brings it to life. And you, you know, you have a, a true gift and talent for drawing people in and, and, and generating interest. One thing I discovered as an undergrad in college to my, I guess, semi surprise, I thought that there were subjects that I was interested in and there were subjects I was not interested in and nothing could change that. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I discovered was that it was possible for a teacher to take a subject that I was inherently passionate about and interested in and make it and make it as boring as anything. I, I didn't think that was actually possible. And, and, you know, on the other hand, to take a subject I didn't even know I could be interested in and draw me in with, you know, with fervor, like, and I had that experience my last semester in college with a 
course in biological anthropology. I had no idea I would even be interested in such a subject. The, the teacher made the difference, huge impact on my life. Teachers, as you know, have a huge impact, certainly potential for impact. And so I just wanted to take this moment to just celebrate you because you're the, sort of the teacher that I imagine, and, and it's subjective to obviously to a point, but you're the teacher everyone wishes they had for everything. That's that's my, <laughs> my opinion you. because, again, of the life that you bring to the subject matter, the passion you bring to it, whether someone is already interested or not. I, I I sort of defy them and challenge them to listen to your lectures and not be drawn in and not not be curious, not want to know more. Everything exists within a context, a larger context, everything we human beings do. And to try to teach any subject out of the larger societal environmental context is to rob that subject of its life, mm -hmm. of its reason to be. This is nothing I was taught. This is something that I came to myself through my own reading. And again, through it, I started taking these jobs, teaching at these extension programs, teaching adults. Now, I had been teaching undergraduates as a teaching assistant, as a graduate student. Mm -hmm. But I was teaching mostly music students who knew how to read and write music. And, and you could deal with a, a technical jargon. And now I'm suddenly teaching adults, no technical jargon is going to work. You can't hide behind uh, pre-existing knowledge. You have to tell them everything you want them to know. And the more I thought about it, things, the more I realized that the historical context is the way to go, is that I can teach Mahler if they understand Mahler's time and place and all his expression and all his fear of death and all of his religiosity is of his time and particularly his personality, uh, which was a function of his time as well. And more and more, especially based on the work of someone named Joseph Kerman, who was a brilliant American musicologist, who again was a generalist. Uh, th th that's a, a pejorative, by the way, when you call someone a generalist, obviously. What you're saying is person knows a lot about a lot, but not a lot about something. Well, no, no. A real generalist is someone who sees the connections, mm. who sees the points of connection and can use the whole story to inform us on both the small scale and the large scale. What high school student has, has not asked the, at least themselves, if not the question aloud, why are we learning this? Right. And, and you know, so you take that into account you when you in when you teach uh whether it's live or whether it's you know via recording you help people to understand why they're learning this why it's worth learning um and that is invaluable did you take to teaching you know quickly did you enjoy it uh and if not what what did what did cuz clearly like at some point you did <laughs> what was no. that that particular journey like for you I, it, again, it wasn't a journey. It just was a very natural extension. Mm. Um, music is storytelling. In fact, pretty much everything we do, I'm convinced, is storytelling. Our species has existed for, a, what, a couple of hundred thousand years, and we've been writing for the last 5,000 years. So the great bulk of human history, the way information was transferred was via stories, which were myths and analogs and metaphors for the lives that were being led and the individuals involved would find, would identify with the stories to the degree that they resonated with their own lives. We're storytelling creatures. We're faced with chaos in this world and we're constantly trying to find order and form in the chaos because otherwise there's no reason to go on. And stories are about finding order in the chaos. I've always like the good story. I've always, I came from a family of joke tellers. My grandmother was an actress. It's all storytelling. Mm -hmm. And writing a piece of music is storytelling. Teaching is storytelling. Uh, a book, an article, it's all storytelling. And a good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Sales is storytelling, right? Yes. It has an exposition. First, you start with the characters in a situation. And then it's got a development where those characters interact to some degree and time passes. It's got a recapitulation where the characters <laughs> emerge, changed. Well, I've just described a very important musical form called sonata, sonata form. form. Yeah. Right. So it's all storytelling. And 
the more I learn, the more interesting the story gets. Of course, the more you realize you don't know. And that's good too, because you're constantly seeking out more information, but trying to contextualize it. And that's the thing. Information without context is meaningless. The small without the large is meaningless. And teachers who teach in a meaningless way are people who've never mastered their material. Sadly, I've been lucky in that I, I, I think we've all had, like you just identified, senior year. We've all had enough good teachers, hopefully, that we know how it looks mm -hmm. when it's done correctly. The music becomes a metaphor for everything. Um, you took a course on what was it? Um, biological anthropology. Biological anthropology. To satisfy, by the way, a, a general right. ed requirement, I had delayed till the end, till the bitter ah. end. <laughs> well, bless you for taking such an interesting course at the end. But mm -hmm. the biological anthropology, I'm sure, revealed truths about things far beyond the subject matter itself. And that's what you want to do. That, that's Listen, If it, I, here's my selfishness. And I'm a very selfish person. <laughs> Um, when I used to teach composition, I used to tell my composition students who are very involved in writing all this modern stuff, which is fine, but don't ask an audience to sit through anything that you wouldn't want to sit through yourself. Write music that you yourself would listen to semi-recreationally. Don't torture anyone because you're taking their time. And that's the one thing no one has enough of. That was my, what I call the Bobocratic oath. And that is, you know, <laughs> do no harm in medicine. For me as a composition teacher and as a composer, waste no one's time. Now, I told you I was selfish. I don't want my time wasted when I'm listening to a piece of music. I need to take something from it. So don't be intrigued by oboe multiphonics, which means making multiple sounds on an oboe simultaneously, which sounds like a combination emergency room porn film. Excuse me, <laughs> you've got to do something with that. The sound by itself is, is brutally ugly. I, I, I mentioned this because I once had a student come in and say, I'm really intrigued by oboe multiphonics. And I said, you know, you might be the only one on the planet. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to do something with it musically. You're going to have to tell a story with it musically. Just having the oboe squawk ain't enough, dude. And so you, uh, you got you got teaching gigs, but you were always composing. You were always making time for composing yeah, on the side. Yeah, I was until it, it it's become more difficult the older I got. And I have to say, I haven't written a note in the last couple of years. Part of that's the pandemic and the need to keep my living going by doing all the blogging and vlogging and bloviating you described before. <laughs> Which, by the way, that is quite a frenetic pace. That's you said oh, it's five, crazy. five days a week. Wow. It's not it's I've, it's down to four now. Yeah. It's it's down to four because now that and I say that by the way, for those who are unaware, I mean it's not like this is not done thoughtlessly. Your pieces um in preparation for this interview, I was just listening to some of your music history Monday podcasts that are available, by the way. You know, he you make a portion of them available for free to the public. And um, I was listening to several of them, and the one I would call out particular attention to, to anyone listening is the one you did on John Williams. Mm. And um, for those looking on Apple podcasts, searching for it, um, that the date of that one of the, the name of the podcast is music history Monday. And the date of that episode was February 8th, 2021. And you do a 20 minute basically course equivalent to your great master's courses on John Williams. And I'll tell you, I was blown away, blown away by this. Like, so this is, this was a day's work for you, but that oh, a no, lot, mul multiple days work. Of course. Yeah. But I mean, I, my point being that a lot goes into those, um, those, those blogs and vlogs and pods that you do. Oh, and I, would, <laughs> I would mention that the music history Monday is a, is um both a post and a, and a podcast that takes some event from that day in music history. Right. And I imagine that was John Williams's birthday. Yeah. Uh, I think it was his what his 82nd or 83rd birthday. Something. And living in LA, I got to he I, I think he still does this. Every year at the Hollywood Bowl, he comes out and conducts 
the orchestra and they do a, a program of his and it's just like oh my if you if you have a, a soul if you have a pulse yeah. and certainly if you if you grew up grew up in my generation i mean it is uh it is overwhelming his music and and it really it you know it makes me wonder again about that sort of out of time thing because it i hear beethoven sometimes in in his scores i'll hear like a, a trace of hey he stole that <laughs> or i mean you know unconsciously or or what have you but it makes me wonder if beethoven were alive in this era would he be composing film scores film music and, um, and that's a really good question he very well might be um i don't think he would be because he was never motivated by, by the commercial art. Correct. He, yeah. there, there was commercial work he could have been doing himself. Uh, what about that, yourself? Did you ever consider film scoring as an avenue for composing or did you just, were you attached to your own original sort of like, yeah. I want to do my stuff? Selfish. Yeah. <laughs> Again, exactly right. Selfish. No, you know, and, and so back to the John Williams. Now on Tuesdays, I do something called, and you know, all my students when I was a teacher called me Dr. Bob. Because they all want to call you Dr. Greenberg because, or Professor Greenberg, because your higher status elevates their own self-image. I'm studying with blah, blah. But I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. So I said, Dr. Bob, that mm -hmm. works for me. So now everyone still calls me Dr. Bob. So my Tuesday blog is called Dr. Bob Prescribes. And it's all about reviewing some recording or set of recordings that I want you to go out and buy. But it's another 3,000 words. So what I want you to do, if if you if you've signed up with me for a couple of bucks a month, as I say to people on Patreon, by the way, Patreon, correct, and we'll post stuff on that. As I tell people, for the cost of parking in Oakland, California, for one hour, <laughs> you have access to me for a month. You know, I I think that's a a heck of a bargain. But anyway, on the Tuesday following that particular uh, podcast, I did a whole three thousand words on the recordings of John Williams, you must own. Mm. And so I picked up where I left off and got quite specific. And the reason why every now and then I do do a piece on movie music, in fact, this is a gig that I feel very strongly about. Our terminology, as I said before, can be our friend because it helps us to distinguish events if we have words with which to distinguish events. But our terminology can also be a terrible enemy. I don't like movie music, or I don't like rap, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. Well, who cares what you don't like? You're just using a term. It's meaningless. Uh, you'll hear people in academia look down at movie music as, 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 as the refuge of the compositional scoundrel. Oh, no. These are some of the most talented composers out there. Yes. They're composing for another medium, but so were opera composers. Mm. So were so was Stravinsky when he wrote the Rite of Spring, which is a ballet. Excuse me, collaborative music might have a different source of inspiration, but it's no different. And John Williams is brilliant. And he mm -hmm. he came from, again, talk about time and place. Mm. He came from that mid, early to mid-20th century tradition of symphonic movie music, where in American film, music was continuous under everything, as opposed to European film, where music was only used under certain circumstances. But American film, the music was a constant presence. And whether we're aware of it or not, it's intensifying everything that goes on, just like in the opera house. And he got to know and deal with, you know, Bernard Herrmann and, and Max Steiner, and, uh, and Henry Mancini and all of these greats who were working in the 40s and 50s. And so he, if you'll excuse the comparison, people out there, John Williams, like Beethoven, who studied with Haydn, who perhaps met Mozart, but studied Mozart's music. John Williams was at a brilliant time and place when he was coming up and learning his craft. He was learning it from some of the best that ever lived. And he himself is among the best that ever lived. And so this is glorious stuff. I hate these divisions we've assigned, these chapter headings. This is jazz mm. and this is rock and roll. And, you know, because it excludes what it doesn't include. And I do use the phrase rock and roll. I do use the phrase movie music, but it's not to exclude anything. It's to include. Mm. 
And that's another one of my, as because I just got on my soapbox. <laughs> it's really important. If we could do away with these meaningless uh, designations, I don't like classical music. Well, of course you like classical music. I can make you like Tchaikovsky and Beethoven and Bach in an hour. I could make you go out and start downloading stuff today. That's easy. It's easy. You just have to know a little bit. That's all you need to do. You just have to know a little bit for to be turned on by it. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else that's as inexpensive and yet as wonderfully life enhancing? I would, and that's illegal. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I would posit to you, no, no. Okay. This is uh, the best of what we are as as human beings. All right. I have some other um, things I want to make sure I fit into this conversation. So. Um, let me just ask you, uh, who is Tom Rollins and how did you first cross paths with him? Tom Rollins was Teddy Kennedy's chief legislative aide, a, uh, a Georgetown and Harvard educated lawyer who decided uh, in the early 90s to start his own business. As he will tell you, he got through law school. Uh, he, was a, he was a notorious truant. So he got to law school by watching videotapes of his courses that were taken, put in the library. And uh, after he got tired of having to, as he himself said, after he got tired of pulling Teddy Kennedy off of waitresses um, time wow. and time again, he decided he was going to go into business and he was going to create a company in which hardcore college courses were taught on videotape and on cassette which were, you know, VHS tape and cassette, which were the media at the time in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And he created something he called the teaching company. Exactly. Yeah. This is for, for people viewing this. This is uh, one of the old school packages. Right. The very first course of yours that I ever uh, purchased, the symphonies of Beethoven. And this is the old school packaging right. um, with, with the compact discs inside. There you go. So he created this thing called the teaching company and started looking around for faculty that would be appropriate, that, that could teach to a wide non-academic public. At exactly the same time, again, talk about how serendipitous our lives are in every aspect. Mm. As I said, in order to get by, after I got my PhD in 84, I started teaching adults and I got really good at it. And some of these adults had other friends and they wanted me to teach in their living rooms. So I started teaching in a living room in San Francisco in a neighborhood called Forest Hill. That's where Willie Mays lives. It's where a lot of very rich people live. Mm -hmm. Big house, huge living room with a stage and a piano at the end. She was an attorney. He was a surgeon. Wonderful people. I ended up teaching there for about 15 years. And at wow. first they brought in their friends. I taught two courses a year, two 10-week courses a year. In fact, that Symphonies of Beethoven is a course I developed teaching in the Hunt's living room. Incredible. And word got out. I never advertised these things. Word got out. And I always have more people than I can accommodate. I can accommodate 40 people. And as it turns out, I didn't know this, but a lot of very high-end medical people and business people and academic people were taking my what we called living room classes, including a guy named Bud Chite, who was dean of the uh, business school at UC Berkeley, the Haas School of Business, uh, including the CEO of, of a big insurance company in San Francisco, a number of CEOs. I only knew these people by, you know, Bill and Antonia and so forth and so on. Well, word got to the Wall Street Journal that there was this guy in San Francisco teaching these very intense high-end music courses to high-end business leaders. Hmm. That was the angle they were interested in. That was the angle they were interested in. And they sent a reporter out, and a locally-based reporter, and she sat in on one of my lectures, and she said, can I join the course? I said, well, it's a little late, but of course. And I was profiled in the Wall Street Journal in April of, of uh, 1992. I'm page three. And um, <laughs> Tom Rollins, who's in the process of putting together a faculty to start his company, mm. 
is sent this article by God knows how many different people. I think this is the kind of person you're looking for. Amazing. So he called me on the phone and we talked and uh, we decided I was going to teach what I was teaching at the conservatory, which was my semester length music history course. And that became great music, which uh, how to listen to and understand great music, which was the first thing I recorded in the spring of 93. Now, since then, if you want to make a course with a teaching company, you have to audition. They they put you out to focus groups. I mean, it's a big, mm. uh, God knows if I could ever make the grade today. Mm. I mean, I often wonder if I applied to Princeton today, would I ever get it? Yeah. Because the competition's so different. But in those days, <laughs> You know, basically, he was looking for warm bodies who could speak clearly. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> but, but, but luckily, this opening course I did basically uh, supported the company for its first three or four years. And uh, amazing. And I mean, you just by, you know, this is the era of uh, mail, snail mail catalogs coming in the mail relentlessly for the for the great. But well, then it was the teaching company. Um, and, you know, you're just the sheer. um number of titles of yours dominated those those catalogs and um you know it was pretty clear that you were one of their um, premium offerings right and 30 courses now just to give people an understanding of what this means what this <laughs> what kind of labor is involved here i have heard you say that it generally took somewhere between 18 and 24 months to do an individual course can you give us a, a you know fairly condensed uh Description of what it took from start to finish to create one of these courses. The earlier courses were easy to create because they are based on courses I created either for adults in living rooms or for my students at the San Francisco Conservatory. But I retired from the conservatory in 2001 in order to make more courses. Hmm. I had my fill of the classroom and had my fill of lying to students about making them feel that they are going to be professional musicians if they only spend wow. these hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to be educated. It, it just it didn't feel right anymore. So when I was creating courses exclusively for the teaching company or the great courses or Wondrium, first, it's a matter of coming up with a course title. And by the time we get to the 2000s, these things are being vetted by all kinds right. of focus groups. So I would submit maybe 10 possible titles and they'd be vetted. And then we'd have to talk about what it's going to cost to license the music I need to use, if that's going to be prohibitive. So we never did make a Mahler symphony course, which I desperately wanted to make because very few orchestras can play the Mahler symphonies and they're all major mm. orchestras and we can't afford the recordings. What I have to ask just personally, selfishly, what about Chopin? You, you know, you, uh, know, that was the one that was always missing like in terms of uh, either of the biography, great master series, or, you know, uh, I mean, you did include in, in your solo piano, which is one of my favorite, by the way, your, your solo piano um, works course, which I, I'm, the title is escaping me at the moment. The 23 greatest solo piano pieces, which there is the go. most horrific title of all time. Right. But you did, Here's you did get the 24th. Right. But there's some fantastic, you know, right? There is some fantastic, um, and and there, I got my Chopin fix through that to a small degree. Right. But was that was there a reason that you um, weren't able to do a, a broader course on Chopin's music and his life? Yeah, as as the teaching company evolved, um, it finally became a very valuable commodity. And Tom Rollins, who you asked me about who I still count as a very good friend, I sold the company in 2006. His timing couldn't have been better. It was not mm. long before the, the crash. And he, he, he made a lot of money. Mm. Um, no one's supposed to know how much money he made. I know how much money he made. Wow. He made a lot of money. <laughs> it, to and, his credit, to his credit, right, what right. a brilliant idea and, what, and, and, and the quality of the product lived up to the the brilliance of the premise correct in my, in my opinion correct unfortunately as these things go when you spend that kind of money for something and it was bought by venture capitalists we all know about venture capitalists they're not in this to create a body of work they're in this to create a body of money mm. and so more and more of the great courses branched out into places where i don't think it should have gone uh yoga courses personal finance courses stuff that was already being done better by others. Hmm. 
uh, which limited increasingly the purely academic courses. Now, not that things don't change, and I understand things must change, and that flexibility is the key word to survival in our world today. Right. Nevertheless, it's it's wise to go home with the person you took to the dance. And what made the great courses special, what made it unique, was that it was delivering super content in a manner most entertaining. Courses on composers were deemed not worth the time and money. Inclu so it's the same old story in education, uh, more broadly speaking, right? Like, what's right. the first thing to get cut? Uh, arts classes. You know, what's the first arts programs from from public schools and what and and whatnot, right? So increasingly, I was told we need blockbuster topics. Blockbuster topics. I wanted to do, for example, Schubert. I never did a course on Schubert. Handel. I never did a course on Handel. Absolutely Chopin. I've been asked so many times. Hmm. And it's absolutely raw, given the other works that I've done, that we haven't done Chopin. And Chopin's easy, too, because there's this wonderful guy named Adam Dunn, who's a, an investment guy in Silicon Valley, who, because he loves Chopin music, Chopin's music so much, he actually, on his own dime, recorded the complete Chopin solo piano music using up-and-coming concert pianists, and also has recorded, using orchestras in Europe, all of Brahms's orchestral music, and has put all of this music up online at a at a site called Muse Open, M-U-S-O-P-E-N, and it could be used free of charge. No royalties whatsoever. And so we have a royalty-free source hmm. of recordings of Chopin's piano music, and that's 99% of everything he wrote. So we can't even use expensive licensing music as an excuse. Hopefully, before I lose my energy, which I haven't lost yet, Glad will, to hear that. <laughs> yeah, we will make that course. But sadly, you know, money needs to be made and folks are short-sighted when money becomes the ultimate object. Right. If, if so, Tom Rollins had been worried about money, he never would have founded the company in the first place. Hmm. He was told it was going to fail, that no one was going to buy academic content on what were entertainment media cassettes hmm. Interest, very interesting because uh i think they did a really effective job with marketing i mean you know those those mail order catalogs were very appealing so how, however they you know whatever went into that and i don't know i think if you're at all a curious person if you're interested in anything you're going to find some you were going to find something in there that would have called out to you and i realize not everyone is necessarily has you know intellectual interests, or maybe they're more entertainment oriented, but there's enough of, there's clearly there were enough takers to make it uh, a successful company. Real quick, I wanted to make sure I didn't overlook that question about yeah, the, the, what went into creating one of these courses start to finish. So, right. so I interrupted so, you. <laughs> oh, no, no, but once I interrupted myself, I did. Have, <laughs> my middle name should be tangent. Um, once you've got the subject matter, it's a matter of putting together a, a library. As you can see behind me, that isn't a fake set. I'm only as good as my library and I need hard copy to hold in my hands. Mm -hmm. You know, all of this stuff available online, notwithstanding, I need to know what the principal works are, hard copy works about a composer or about a subject. I need to own them. I need to write in them. I need to um, internalize what's in them. And so, you know, I, one of the best compliments I've received are when people inquire as to how many research assistants I have, and I just want to laugh at them. And I said, you're looking at them. I don't have research. Are you, ki are you kidding? I can't write about something unless I know about something. Mm -hmm. I have no assistance. I have, to, and I have to read and know. But you have, a, and one of your talents is distilling from the many sources that you clearly right. uh, have your nose in there. Uh, you know, distilling what is essential and making it damn entertaining for if, if people looking for a starting place, let's say you have no music background whatsoever. I would personally refer you. So uh, 
Bob Greenberg has a uh, a subset of his courses for the great courses was called Great Masters, and they were essentially biographies of composers that included music in them, but basically told the stories of their lives. And so there's you know this is again the bringing history to life, and my personal favorite of them, and they're all great, you can't go wrong. But my personal favorite is the one you did on Franz Liszt because that that one is pure entertainment. I mean, you don't have to care a damn about music. This is just titillating soap opera-esque, but in the most en entertaining guilty pleasure kind of way, this guy's life. Franz you, Liszt. You've, but... you've just identified his music perfectly. Hmm. I mean, the guy, the guy truly, truly was the prototype for everyone that came after him, whether it was Sinatra or Elvis, anyone who made women mad and <laughs> right. he, was the first, he was the first rock star, right? And you know what? I, I generally pull away from that, but yes, he was the first rock star in that his persona was as important as his music. As it turns out, his pianism was perhaps the greatest of all time. Yeah. So he had the goods to back it up. You want to talk about the Beatles, for example, of having the musical goods to back up the persona. Uh, Liszt had the musical goods. And so he was the complete package and a fascinating human being who knew all the other fascinating human beings of his time. So thank you. Yeah. And thank again, I, I, I keep doing this, um, but I digressed and, you know, I, I do want to understand the process of putting these courses together. So you're basically you're knee deep, head deep in research and, you know, wow. I mean, everything in your courses is, you know, uh, extensively, um, you know, referenced and and quoted from, and there's no there's no there's no question ever about where, where how do you know where where this came from, but you made it like it. Whereas reading one some of these books, let's face it, they're not all the no. most engaging, <laughs> entertaining books. But no, they're and, not. <laughs> so so that's one of the services that you provide is you you did all of the hard the labor for us and waded through immense amounts of text and God knows what else to to distill it down to its most sort of like entertaining essence and and also to give us the greatest under understanding and context and um you know so yeah it's, it's, they're phenomenal then they're i both. have to choose the music that i want to use yep and then get the licensing obviously right. which well that's their that's their problem okay course. but for example in the case of the list there's there's you know i mean the complete list is on like 35 or 40 compact discs i have the chance to play a tiny tiny fraction of those yeah and i don't play an entire work ever there's no time to do that so What's the best piece to use as an example of this? And then I have to use my skills as a composer in that. And, and, and again, this is my arrogance. Um, I feel that a composer can teach music best if a composer can communicate. Because when I look at a piece of music, it's not just the historical background. I'm looking at it as a composer looks at something. Why these pitches? Why mm. these rhythms? What are you trying to say? What's behind the choices you made? Because we have to remember any piece of music is an accumulation of choices. Just like any book is an accumulation of words. Why these words? Why these characters? Why this story? What led you on that path? I have to try to, as best as I can, with the understanding that I'm limited by my own knowledge, I have to try to put myself. But in it far exceeds, system. I would imagine, ninety nine point nine nine percent of your listeners, and so it's 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 really that right. much appreciated because we're getting a lot of insight from the mind of someone who really deeply understands music and composition. But also, you know, you did the homework, so you also provide the the context, the historical right. context. You give us all the salacious details of their lives, I live uh, un that. unapologetically. Um, and you know what, I I I I want to I. I really value your time and there are some other things I want to make sure I ask you. So let's, let's just get first. Let's have, I'm going to stop talking and stop interrupting you and let you finish explaining the creation of a course. Go ahead. So, so again, once the music is selected, once I've done my research, now it's a matter of writing. Now you're talking about these great masters. I think there are eight lectures each and each lecture is going to run about 5,000 words with about seven or eight minutes of musical excerpts. Um, I have to hit my mark. In those courses, I had to hit my mark because they were made in 98, 99, and they were going on cassettes as well as CDs. Hmm. And the longest side you had on a cassette was 45 minutes. And so the lectures could not be longer than 45 minutes. 
And if you're a college teacher, that's okay, because of course, lectures tend to be 50 minutes. So I, you know, I, I, I got into a 45 minute grind and you have to hit your mark. Yeah. Uh, we started using teleprompters in 98. Before that, it was just a sheaf of notes that I'd carry around on stage. Teleprompter changed everything because everything had to be scripted. But if everything is scripted, you're not repeating yourself. You're getting all your tenses right. You're getting uh, your grammar right. And you've got an editor who can fine tooth comb what you've done. So I had two editors, a content editor and then a fact checker. And that made the courses starting in 98 uh, qualitative. Interesting. Qualitatively better. Uh, the prompter was great. And, you know, it's easy to perform in front of a prompter that it looks like you're being completely casual. Sure. Yeah. And it comes across too very spontaneous. Right. I, I would listen to the audio. So I, I, can, I can only imagine how many automobiles you you have been in uh, uh out of you know disembodied bob right. in in automobiles all over the country people commuting listening to your courses and yeah they do they do amazingly even though they're all very carefully scripted they come across very spontaneous very energetic you know uh and and I, and that takes something in the writing so then they they actually have to be written and i want them to sound when i'm writing for writing i write differently than when i write for speaking mm. It just has to be a different animal. And when you put all that stuff together, it's not 24 months, but but for a 24, it depends how long the piece is. Some uh, One of my courses is 48 lectures. That's 36 hours. That That's a lot of work. Uh, a lot of them are 32 lectures. Were you given an advance? Like, is that how this operated? Were you given like a flat fee to live off of so that you could work on these or? Not enough to live off of and and... Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not going to go to the money side here. Okay, that's fine. Because we're going to get a source of frustration. <laughs> um, but you do it because you want to get it right. And when I started doing this for a living in 2001, this gave me an opportunity to reach so many more people than I could ever reach in a classroom. And in a classroom, you basically teaching the same kids the same thing year after year. Whereas with the great courses, I could always be, I'm always doing a new topic. I can go where my interest was dragging me and my interest mm -hmm. is all over the place. Now, yeah, sometimes my courses were turned down uh, because they didn't focus group properly or they didn't this or they didn't that. But really up to 2017, I was able to do pretty much what I wanted to do. Amazing, what a, what a privilege, that's awesome. Right. So, And what a privilege for your listeners too. So between the research and the writing and the selecting the music and then selecting the musical excerpts, we're looking at a good a good eight, nine months. Plus, then you have to go to the studio and do the recording. But that was always the easiest part. It's almost an afterthought. You know, it's it's like, and that's true in anything having to do with music or athletics. It's it's always the mm -hmm. training that takes the most time. It's always the practice that takes the most time. The actual performance goes by in a flash. But unless you're totally prepared, the performance is not going to work. And again, as a musician, I'm only as good as my preparation. I know that. So I go in loaded for bear. I am really ready. I've rehearsed. I've, um, I've rewritten and rewritten and rewritten again. When I get in front of the camera, I'm ready to go, just like an athlete's ready to go. When he or she gets out on the field. Yeah, and it's like performance is, is the fun part in a right. lot of ways. And right. it's the reward for all the work that you did, right? Exactly. Now you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Exactly. Hmm. Um, so we talked about how you mentioned the salacious details of these composers' lives, and it makes it titillating and interesting for the listener. And you also did a series for Aura TV, O R A dot TV, called Scandalous Overtures that focused exclusively, and they're very well done, very entertaining on, um, you know, the sort of more salacious side of various composers' lives and 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 stories that they would ra have rather forgotten in most cases, uh, or not, you know, probably preferred not be put out there on the internet. Um, but this begs for me a really interesting question that has come up, especially in recent years, which is this idea of, you know, appreciating art created by less than, you know, some unsavory characters, right? Whatever the art, whatever the medium happens to be, you know, can we enjoy or appreciate art 
um, if we know horrible things about the creator, what are, what are your personal thoughts about that? You might find my response flippant. Mm -hmm. That's okay. If someone is alive and I know they're a jerk, I won't talk about them, especially if I've had bad interaction with that person. But if it's a conductor, I won't use that conductor's recordings. If it's a composer and I know a few jerks, I, I just won't glorify their music. But mm. once they're dead, I don't care. <laughs> because I can't do them any good once they're dead. They're finished. Yeah. Now, now I'm happy to talk about that person. Listen, there's no one on the planet who can look themselves in the mirror and say that I am without sin. Right. There's not a single one of us that can cast the first stone. Some of us uh, have sinned rather more than others. Richard Wagner, the 19th century composer of German language um, opera and music drama, is one of them. But I'm not going to live my life without Wagner just because he was a jerk. Because he has something to say to me, something to teach me, and something with which I, my life is elevated. So, quite frankly, if that was our criteria <laughs> right. for, for anything... I imagine a lot of the doctors that created the vaccines that keep us alive mm. were jerks. Are we not going to use the vaccine because these people were jerks? I mean, where does this stop? Where yeah, does this no, it's a great point. And and uh, do you have a personal, uh, is there a line for you personally where you say, I cannot over, like what I know about this creator is interferes with my ability to even go there. Are there any such examples for you? I mean, I think it's a very personal, you know, uh, uh, sensibility, right? There are, you know, generally speaking, people who are wonderful artists in whatever field, as authors, as poets, painters, architects, um, sculptors, musicians, I, I should say not just music, I should say, you know, composers. Um, they tend to be free thinkers. That's why they are who they are. They tend to be, whether you like it or not, extremely liberal in their political beliefs in every age. And that is, I need my freedom to do what I'm doing. And they tend to therefore say, and you deserve your freedoms too. However, having said that, there are certain people I, I wouldn't do. Uh, Karl Orff, whose Carmina Burana remains one of the most popular works in the repertoire. I just won't do. He wrote Carmina Burana for the Nazi leadership in the mm -hmm. mid-1930s. It was one of the most popular pieces uh, of Nazi Germany. It's one of the few pieces of, of, of Nazi-related art that has survived the Third Reich, uh, just like there are a few buildings still in Berlin that were, that were built um, and are being used uh, to this day. Uh, I, I won't. I won't teach Carmina Burana. I just won't. There's a number of uh, Anna Neptrenko, who's a brilliant Russian soprano. Um, I'm trying to remember Vitsiev. I'm trying to remember her name, a pianist. There are a number. Uh, Gurgiev, the uh, the conductor. There are a number of Russian musicians living and working today who have been staunch supporters of the Putin regime and the invasion. Uh, to the degree that they, you know, go and perform in uh, in occupied cities in Ukraine, they're on my shit list forever. <laughs> I will never, ever use their music, and I just won't. So there are some lines, and now, of course, the latter. We're talking about people who are still alive. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, the people who make high end art for Wagner perhaps being an exception. And uh, oh, you mentioned Scandalous Overtures and, and the name just slipped out of my head. The uh, the composer of Madrigals who killed his wife and, and her lover um, has gone out of my head. There are some unsavory people out there, but um, we're all unsavory. We, <laughs> we are, we are. I mean, do we, do we not watch certain film actors or actresses because yeah. of their drug use and their, you know, I, I, well, and drug use doesn't necessarily make someone right, a, a bad right. person. Right. So right. there, Michael I, Jackson, I, I, I will not do Michael yeah. Jackson. 
Okay. There you okay. go. There, that's where you draw the line. Okay. Um, there. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. It's a really interesting topic. I, I attended a panel here in LA sometime before the pandemic on this subject, and various experts of various fields were a part of it. And one one of I think it was an art historian who pointed out that in today's day and age, we we learn everything about everyone. Right. It's automatically instantly online the moment anyone makes a transgression, however slight. It's it's all over the world, right? And she pointed out that there are artists that date back centuries whom we know next to nothing about. So it's it's not, you know, it, like they who knows what they did or didn't do, but they're not subject to the same scrutiny as artists today. I thought that was a very interesting point. Um, OK, so I was going to um, say, I'm just going to yeah. add in their modern research. There are some out there now who have very good arguments. We know that Schubert, as I said before, was diagnosed with syphilis in 1824, which he would have contracted at the end of summer of 1823. What we've known for a long time is that he he partied with a guy named uh, von Schober. Uh, I'll remember as Franz von Schober, I believe it was, and who was a bad boy and who was gay. And Schubert was bisexual, but but certainly more gay than not. Uh, so we've known that he probably got his syphilis from a prostitute. Then the word has come out that he probably got his syphilis from a male prostitute. Now certain people believe he got his syphilis from an underage male prostitute mm. and that that was Schubert's thing. Because Schubert's friends, even his gay friends, uh, talked about Schubert's disgusting habits. And um, his gay friends were not talking about gayness as being disgusting. They were probably talking about his penchant for underage boys. Mm -hmm. And now, does this change our view of Franz Schubert? Uh, for some still, people, it might, right? It it's, might, and it, but it's hearsay. But where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, again, I address this issue when I'm teaching Schubert, um, but I don't let it. I try not to let it dominate the artistic part of his impulses or the fact that he otherwise, that he was living at a time. And I guess that's part of it too. You know, woke culture now, and I'm very left wing. And I hate the phrase woke culture, and here I just used it. But we, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do what we're trying to do so often today. And that is to apply contemporary standards. Right to ages that had completely different social beliefs. And, and this, yeah, this brings us sort of full circle to this notion of context and the importance right. of it. Right. Um, and, and, you know, who knows, who knows how any of us may have behaved born in a different time in a different place. Um, so I, I find all of this, again, it's all speculative and sort of um, arguably pointless, but I find it very interesting because, because it, uh, it helps us, return as honestly as possible to our humanity. We are a complicated mixture of things, each and every one of us. And sometimes it's just to use a phrase, but for the grace of God that, you know, that we, uh, we, I don't know, accomplish anything in this world or, or avoid uh, horrible things. Um, so yeah, there, there are a couple other things if, if you have the time that I, sure, I would like sure, to just right ask. Ahead. So um one of the things, you know, and you shared this on your blog, so I, I figure it's fair game to ask you about, because, and this speaks to the, on the subject of suffering, which I think, uh, you know, anyone would agree is is not not the whole of life, but um, an inseparable part of it. it. To be alive is to suffer. It's 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 part of the gig. And one of the things that I learned about you um, as I was researching this. Uh, I'll quote from one of your blog posts from several years ago. You mentioned, I, you, you, I, I'll, I'll do my best Robert Greenberg. And I quote, <laughs> <laughs> I am in my fourth marriage, though I'd hasten to point out that that's not because I'm a disagreeable monster, although my first wife from whom I am divorced might beg to disagree, but because I've lost two wives to cancer. Yeah. This, I, I just, I just, my heart bled for you, um, pr metaphorically speaking, to read that. And I actually have a friend who similarly lost two wives to cancer. 
And this is, I mean, people suffer all kinds of tragedies in life and, and I'm not trying to compare because it's a pointless game, but I think it's an undeniable thing to just say, wow, like the ouch. And that is some intense, yeah. intense um, suffering. Uh, and I'm just curious to know how you got through that and how you, you know, how you, I don't know how you, how you dealt with that, what you have to say about that. I didn't get through it. I'll never get through it. You know, you experience certain kinds of uh, grief in your life. Grief, grief to me is an inexplicable emotion. Mm. You know, nature rarely makes a mistake. Evolution rarely makes a mistake. I mean, yes, our knees and our elbows and our teeth, but we weren't. We were only supposed to last thirty-five years. You know, theoretically, our joints would be great after thirty-five years, but grief makes no sense in terms of evolution, because it's so paralyzing that you don't want to reproduce anymore. Well, anything that would keep you from reproducing, you'd think evolution would have taken care of. Um, you know, I, I, I lost my second wife to cancer when she was just 35. She gave me two little babies. Um, one of them was three when she died, and the other was 10 months old. I was 55, 20 years older than she was. So at the age of 55, I was a single dad of two kids in diapers. Mm. And, uh, and that was 13 years ago. And then I remarried and then she got cancer. Um, how do you handle these things? You have a lot of people, first of all, we can all be cynical, but we really do have our villages. And people really do come out for you. And I survived because of all the love in my community. Very simply, none of us is an island and folks step up. And that's amazing. And so even in the darkest moments, you have a, a very renewed sense of, um, of faith in humanity. Hmm. But, you know, you never get over certain things. I'll never get over. And, you know, I, uh, parenthetically, I lost my mother when I was six to cancer. So... It's a bad confluence of events, and these deaths later in my life dredged up a lot of stuff from earlier in my life. But you know, I have four kids, two older from my first marriage and then two from my second marriage, and the two right now are just 14 and 16. You go on. Yeah, what else is there? Mm -hmm. There's no other option. Mm -hmm. But you do have moments of darkness that are as dark as they come. And you let them come, and and then they go, and then you pick back up again. Wow! And what about music as a salve, or as a um, where does music factor into grief? I think work factors into grief for me. I wouldn't just say music. Uh, my wife was diagnosed with. My second wife, Diane, was her name. She was diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer eight weeks after my son was born. That was July 29th of 2009. So she immediately, you know, the diagnosis, I mean, she wasn't even staged out. Um, it was, we can treat, we can't cure. So she went into chemo. This was a very beautiful, very powerful, very smart, talented, professional flute player. Very loving, funny woman. And... Um, you know, it's a cliche, you read the, the obituaries all the time, such and such fought with great courage and died surrounded by her family. And that was our story as well. And after she, you know, she was in and out of the hospital. And after she came back from the hospital for the last time in late August of 2009, and she lived another five weeks, right on the other side of that wall is our bedroom. And the cancer had gotten into her lungs. And she basically coughed to death. I was working on my Wagner course, my, uh, the music of Richard Wagner, at that time. Without that course, I would have gone mad. Wow. But it was the work, the focus. Now, at one point, I said to my team, our, our whole, we had about eight people that were part of our team. Early on, I said, I'm going to give up my work. I'm going to dedicate myself full time to getting, getting Diane better. And my team convened with Diane at the head of the table, and I was told in no uncertain terms that that wouldn't work, 
Diane was not interested in that, that I should keep doing my thing because otherwise I was going to become the world's biggest pain in the ass. And of course, they were completely right. And it was the focus on the work that helped me stay sane. And after she passed, it was the focus on my work that helped me stay sane. A friend of mine who's a wonderful painter commissioned me to write five love songs for his wife on the occasion of what was then her 50th birthday. The commission fee was going to be any painting in his studio. And I worked on those songs immediately after her death. Mm -hmm. And while it was terribly sad to be writing love songs, it was cathartic without the work. You know, that's the most important thing I could say to anybody is stay involved in your in your work, stay involved in your life. Do everything you can to feel that I accomplished something today at very least. That's what got me through it. In all honesty, without that, I wouldn't have, I, I don't think I could have survived it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, love and work, right? As Freud yeah. Yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, there's a book by the very famous psychotherapists, actually psychiatrist by training, Irv Yalom. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with his work. And uh, he's had an incredibly illustrious career and uh, as a writer in addition to a therapist. And he, he also had a very, very long lasting marriage with a very accomplished woman, his wife, Marilyn, also very accomplished in her field, in her academic field. And uh, she eventually, in I don't know, I mean, in, in later, certainly lived a, a long life, but, uh, you know, got cancer and he had to deal with this loss. And, and interestingly, he felt that he, you know, he had helped people grieve for decades. That was his that was his gig, right? That was his work. But he he felt until he was going through it himself, he, he didn't really get it until he finally was going through it himself. But um, his wife, he was he had a book project in mind and his wife insisted that they work on a book together as a. Uh, uh, they they wrote alternating chapters. The book is a really, really moving, touching book called, I believe it's called A Matter of Death and Life. Was she and, ill at the time? Yes. She knew she was terminal, but her oh. motivation for doing it was she knew he needed the, the gig, that, that she felt he needed the project to get him through it. So she was thinking of him <laughs> in her last days, but, and, and he, he concedes that it was, she was right. You know, it, it's, it was, uh. It gave him some some purpose, and of course, it was an extremely meaningful one too. It's a beautiful book. This is one of the miracles of sick people, or, or at least in terms of this Diane I'm telling you about, and 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 the wife you're describing. They're the ill ones. They're the ones that are facing death, and yet they're still the caregivers. They're the ones who are making it, who are trying to make it easy on the ones. We're going to suffer the loss, even though their loss is the greatest of all. They're losing their lives. Mm. And I've observed this, you know, once you become conscious of it, because until you go through it, no one wants to think about this stuff. And rightly so. Who the hell wants to think about cancer? It's the, it's the ultimate C word, right? But once you become part of that family, you, you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. Mm. And it's extraordinary the degree to which sick people take on the role of caregiver, even if you're physically caregiving the sick person, emotional caregiving. Yeah. Some don't, but in my case, and in the case you're describing, they do. And it's just one of those small and terrifying miracles you experience <laughs> during the process. Wow. Uh, now you did marry again. I did. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I had to. I had two little kids, a self-employed musician. <laughs> <laughs> um, did and, you put out a sign how did you how did you find uh <laughs> my fourth wife was a family fix-up how about that and uh my sister-in-law back in boston has a great friend who was a judge in newton massachusetts and the judge had a niece who was a pediatrician in san francisco and uh and that was the fix-up and it worked amazing yep We've been wow. married almost 10 years. Wow. Amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Yep. Lucky. Um, Lucky. Yes. Lucky. Yes. Um, Dr. Bob Greenberg, uh, this has such been such an incredible privilege. I've been a, um, you know, uh, 
I'm going to fanboy out again just for a moment. I mean, I've really been a, a great admirer of your work and it's really, you know, been a, it's really just made my life better. And I know that I'm speaking for many, many other people who have been touched by it. So I just want to thank you both for your time today and just for everything you've put out into the world. Um, and um, I would, I would, I suppose, end this by saying, you know, at this point in time uh, with, with, all that you've lived through and all that you've done, what 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 comes next for you and what what is your aspiration personally, professionally, however you want to put it? Who is the person you want to be moving forward now? I keep telling myself what I think is a lie, but I hope to God it's not. And that is, I want to stabilize things. Um, we didn't mention, but I, I had a triple bypass surgery about six weeks ago. Oh my God. God, I had I know, no on idea. top of everything else. I know I had and I, no I, idea. <laughs> I kept blogging through all of it. You oh know, I mean, right. I'm self-employed. When you're self-employed, you got a really rotten boss who makes you work all the freaking time. Yeah, you got to get on his Patreon, folks. Oh, especially if you have if you have right. any significant um sense of philanthropy in you or 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 money and money to back it up. Please, please support this fine gentleman on his Patreon. And you'll get you'll get compensated beautifully. Oh, content. you will. You will. But but anyway, back to that point. It, it, the point of it is I just right now my life is stabilizing. And the lie I'm telling myself and I want it to be true is I'm recording another great courses course in August. I'll be back there in August. But after that's done, I want to start writing my music again. Uh, there's a whole bunch of pieces I want to write. And I haven't been doing it for a couple of years. And I have all these ideas. Hmm. And I'm promising myself that because that's really what I want to do. And I turned 69 years old on Tuesday. None of us is getting any younger. The time is moving faster every day. If not now, when? Right? Hmm. And Yes, I still have two youngins that got to go to college, but we'll figure out the money when we have to figure out the money. I I, I want to get back to my first love, which is scribbling. <laughs> it's been a total pleasure. Thank you so much for this conversation and also just for your openness. And um, uh, I would encourage people, actually, let's do the plug. So where would you direct people who are interested in your, in your work? You have a lot of work out there. Right. Um, I would encourage people to check out my website, which is easy. It's robertgreenbergmusic.com. And uh, all of my, I, I'm, I'm partnered with the great courses with Wondrium. So if you want hard copy of these courses, which is becoming increasingly hard to buy, you have to buy them through Wondrium, through the great courses. But everything is download now, including the written materials. And there's a lot of written materials with my courses. And they can all be down, you know, bought and downloaded from my website. Um, and my customer care is much better than that of one dream. So if something goes wrong, write me. Uh, we fix everything, we meaning me and my tech guy. We fix everything within a day. So I would encourage you to check out those course offerings. Um, they go on sale at the same time as this stuff at the teaching company. So there's no financial advantage to buying from them. Second of all, there's my Patreon site, which is really what I'm doing almost full time even after the pandemic. And that can be found at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg music. And I'm sure you'll put something up. Uh, yeah. I'll include uh, links to all this stuff. Right. Right. And uh, like I say, you know, uh, you give what you want. Um, you have to give a certain amount of money to get access to everything, but I don't want to say how inexpensive it is because it's going to hurt me. Uh, inexpensive to access most everything. So I would encourage you to join me. And uh, if you are on Patreon, you can, you can write me directly anytime you want uh, and question me about anything you want. And uh, so it, it opens up a door as well. Beautiful. And also on his website, for those interested and may be overwhelmed and not know where to begin with the great courses, you have a, um, a sort of a prescription of uh, here's here's how to here's how to wade through this. Right. These are the these are the introductory courses. These are the courses that are, you know, uh, composer biographies. These are the people who have a little more um, knowledge of theory and whatnot. Uh, you know, what is the word, the term that I'm missing here? Uh, uh, Curriculum. 
curriculum uh, or syllabus or what have you, like right. how, how to wait, how to, what, or what sequence to, um, right. to exactly. look at them in. And, Prerequisites um, versus, versus more technical courses. Yeah. And I would also just encourage people, if you want to try before you buy, check out the Music History Monday podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. And also um, he has a, a YouTube channel, which I believe is just at Robert Greenberg Music, where you can check out excerpts from among, among the things on that channel are excerpts of the actual courses. So you can get a sampling to whet your appetite. In my personal opinion, you cannot go wrong. Just choose one, begin, and it'll really enrich your life. And uh, to me, music is on you know among the very top of the list of things to live for. And um, and Dr. Greenberg's courses will make them that much more just appealing and beautiful to you, and you know just help you appreciate your life, which is. Uh, you know, which is the most precious thing we have. So thank you again so much for your time today. And I wish you all the best. And I, and I really hope you get to live out your dream and, and bring forth what's within you, musically speaking. Thank you so much, Eric.